Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thank you so much for joining us today as we come off of a very festive 4th of July weekend. Hopefully you had fun and hopefully you had a safe celebration wherever you are. And appropriately, today's program is going to be all about celebrations at sea. So we are going to talk a little bit about how sailors built community at sea and also some of the amazing things that they celebrated while they were out at the ocean for six to nine months at a time. So my name is Alicia, and I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York City. I will be your host for today. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free. And if you'd like to support us in delivering programs just like these, I invite you to check out the links in the comments or in the descriptions. So feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before. And of course, if you've got any questions, you can put them there as well. So for those of you who may not be familiar, this is the Intrepid Museum. So our complex is located on the west side of Manhattan in the Hudson River. Our museum is actually housed inside of a historic World War II aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. And we also have a historic Cold War era submarine, the Space Shuttle Enterprise, and a British Airways Concorde on site. And of course, as you can see in the picture too, it's really, really, really big. So our ship is actually 913 feet long. It is so big that if you stood it up on its end, it would be as tall as a New York City skyscraper. And it is also so long, we like to say that you could almost play three games of football on it at the same time. So this was a very important ship and it was constructed way back in 1943 for a very specific purpose. So it was made during a time when we were fighting countries all the way across oceans. And of course, we didn't want to have to launch our planes over here in America and then fly them all the way across the water to get over there because that would take way too much fuel and way too much time. So we created aircraft carriers just like the Intrepid. Now, something else that I like to point out is a little bit of the history of how this ship was made. So the keel of our ship, the bottom part of it, was actually laid in Newport News, Virginia on December 1st, 1941 in preparation for World War II. And then just six days later on December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked a day that will live in infamy. And of course, it dragged the United States into the conflict, and it also dragged a number of their male shipyard workers into the war overseas. So about 400 women were then called in to temporarily fill some of those positions in the shipyards to keep up with all the wartime needs. And uh, you also can tell they probably had to also build those big ships as well. So their presence was immediately felt, and this giant Essex-class aircraft carrier was estimated to take three years to construct, but thanks to all of their hard work, it ended up taking just 17 months. So, as you can see in this picture right here, this is a newspaper clipping from the New York Times in 1943. It says, women at work, they help turn out the ships of war. All right, so that is a wonderful uh, clipping that we have here from our original launch of the Intrepid at Newport News, Virginia there. Again, this giant Essex-class carrier, they were so, so impactful. And in many ways, then, we could also say that, well, the first celebration for the Intrepid, and really the ship as a whole, it was kind of like a baby shower or a baptism, right? It was the ceremonial ship launching ceremony. Now, on April 26th, 1943, just prior to its launch, the USS Intrepid underwent its longtime naval tradition there of wishing it good luck. And that included Helen Smith Hoover, the wife of a Navy admiral, smashing a bottle of champagne against the ship and officially naming it as it was launched, the Intrepid. The other photo that you can see here shows a ceremonial gift exchange between her and one of the welders from the shipbuilding yards as well. So our ship was in service from 1943 through 1974. And of course, it later became a museum in 1982 after being saved from the scrapyard. So of course, being a museum, we do like to display a lot of cool things to bring the space to life. And this is one example of those very cool things, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, I know you might be thinking, wait a minute, chairs, what? Why are we looking at chairs? Well, we do have chairs on display right now. Um, these are artifacts, and they can tell us a lot about what life was like on board the ship. So if you look at all of these chairs, some of them look pretty common, you know, maybe even similar to chairs that you might even have at your house 
or maybe at work or at school. And also some of them look a little bit more complicated. But this, looking at all of these chairs, is a wonderful way for us to take a closer look at what people were doing on board a ship like the Intrepid. We can think about what they were used for based on how they look, uh, maybe if you've seen them somewhere before, and we can also think about where they might have been seen on a ship. So take a moment, everyone. Look at these chairs here, and I want you to point on the screen for me, which one do you think looks the most boring? Which of these is kind of the most normal, boring chair? Maybe you've even sat in one yourself at an office or at a school. What do you think? Tell me know in the chat if you want, or you can go ahead and just stick your finger right on the screen for me there. So everyone, to me, this one right here on the end, this green one, it looks the most boring and typical to me. This is a pretty standard looking office chair. And it tells us that just like on land, people held regular office jobs while on board the Intrepid at sea too. Now, not everyone was a pilot, of course, or had to lift and lower the anchor there. There were plenty of other important paperwork jobs to be done too. So that is just one type of job that we might find on board the Intrepid. Now, I want you to take a look at these again. Look real closely. Look at this screen and tell me which chair do you think is the most comfortable? All right, so take a close look here. Which of these do you think would be the most comfortable to sit on? Maybe something you can imagine curling into, something soft and cozy with a nice book or watching movies or something like that. So tell me in the chat which one you think is the most comfy, or you can go ahead again and put your finger right on the screen there for me. When I look at these chairs, everyone, I think this one looks the most comfortable. In fact, it kind of looks like, you know, a nice comfy recliner that you might have in your living room or maybe one of those nice uh, movie theater seats, you know, that we're all so excited to get back to. But believe it or not, these were used specifically for pilots in their ready room. So pilots had one of the most stressful jobs on board the Intrepid, and the ready room was designed to be as comfortable as possible for them. So here's a picture of a bunch of pilots in that ready room, in those seats. You can uh, kind of think of the ready room like a classroom for them, where they'd all learn about their missions before they go. And under the seats, they actually had little lockers for their things um, and even little desks that folded up and over them to take notes. So very much like you might have at school, too, lockers and desks and things. Uh, and so they would sit in these chairs to prepare themselves for flights. So again, it's kind of like a school chair, but uh, you know, a really, really comfortable one. And I don't know about you, but if I had a really comfortable chair like that in school, I might fall asleep. Don't tell anyone. Now, after the pilots were in these chairs, they got into another type of chair, and that would be this one right here. Now, looking at this chair, does anyone know, what would you call a chair like this? Tell me in the chat if you happen to know. What do you call a chair it's this big, light greenish looking one to the right of it. It's got all these straps on it. It's kind of a big, scary looking chair. But, you know, I bet all of those straps and all that padding and stuff might have had something to do with the job that that chair performed. Well, this, everyone, is an ejection chair. So you see, a long time ago, if something bad happened to your plane and you actually had to climb out of the cockpit, you had to climb out onto the wing and then jump off and then... Hopefully you had your parachute with you and then you could, you know, float back down to safety. But as you can imagine, super, super dangerous to do that. And in fact, here is an image of an ejection chair being used. So again, to, to contrast it now with what you used to have to do, if your plane's going forward, the tail of it, the back part of it, you can actually get tangled up in your parachute after you jump if you're very close to it. So these ejection seats were created. You would pull a handle either on the top or on the bottom, and then it would shoot you up and away from your plane very fast so the plane could go down, and then you would be far enough away. You could then float back down to safety with your parachute into the water below. Now, if you landed in the water in the ocean, sometimes, you know, that ejection chair is shooting you far away. Sometimes you're not going to land very close to your own ship. Um, and also, you know, who knows where you were flying around to. So you might actually be closer to another ship. So that ship would come by, they'd pick you up. But remember, all of your stuff is still back on the Intrepid. So eventually, you're going to need to transfer ships. And that is where this last chair here on the end, the white one comes in. Uh, comes in. So this chair is called the Highline chair. 
and it works kind of like a zip line. There is a cable that would go through the top of the chair. You can see that little hole at the very top. Um, the cable would go through that and then they would connect it between the ship you were on and the ship you wanted to go to. And then the, they would just zip you right across the water to get you back to your ship. Uh, so here's actually a picture of it in action to bring that to uh, life for you a little bit more. There's that chair right in the center with someone sitting on it with a big bundle of something behind them. Maybe it's a food resupply or uh, maybe it has some of their own possessions. But as you can imagine, it looks kind of like a wild ride, right? You can see the choppy water below and it's very important that they keep that line very tight because if it's not, boop, it's gonna bow down and you are gonna dunk that pilot. So hopefully you don't want that to happen. Now there is one last chair here that I haven't mentioned yet. This one right here, a little bit difficult to see there, uh, but it is there. And can anyone tell me if you can see what type of chair do you think this one is? Let me know in the chat if you have any idea. Does this look familiar to you? What does it kind of look like? And again, keeping in mind that it is kind of old, but still functions pretty much the same way now. What does this kind of look like to you? Any guesses? So this, everyone, is a dentist chair, believe it or not. So you might think, why do we have a dentist chair on display at the Intrepid Museum? Well, once again, it is there to remind us that the Intrepid is traveling around the world, and these men would be out at sea for a very long time. And because they were out in the middle of the ocean, they had to take everything with them that they might want to have at home. So that also included things like people who had jobs that you would need, things like dentists and doctors and surgeons in case they got sick or had an emergency. They also even had barbers so that they could get their hair cut. You know, all these community worker positions that we take for granted, having them on land in our own neighborhoods, but they also had to think about having them at sea on board as well. So again, this idea of having a whole city at sea on board the ship was really, really important. So everyone, before we move on and talk a little bit more specifically about these celebrations on board, I wanna pause and see if we have any questions. So any questions at all, let me know what you have. Any questions? How many people served on the Intrepid? So the Intrepid typically had about 3,200 men on board at any time. Uh, again, they were out at sea for about six to nine months at a time. So that is about the length of an entire school year. Uh, and also keep in mind that most of them were just, you know, 18 to 23 years old. So that's pretty young. And for many of them, this was their very first time away from home. So it was really exciting. You know, you get to travel all around the world, but it was also kind of scary at the same time. So as we're going to talk a little bit more about later today, celebrations and these wonderful you know, festivities that they would have on board were a really great way for them to bond with their other sailors and uh, many times make them feel a little bit more at home with things like food and other traditions that they would be used to as well. Any other questions? Did any women serve on the Intrepid? So no, they didn't. Uh, throughout its 31 years in service, no women ever served on board. Um, that's just how things were back then, unfortunately. Uh, but I always like to say it is impossible to pass through the ship's decks without encountering the impact of women in some way. Uh, many women, as I mentioned, helped to build the Intrepid, first of all, uh, because so many of those men had to go off fighting overseas. So the ship is floating today because of them. Also, of course, we've heard of uh, that you know timeless uh, you know idea of Rosie the Riveter. So these ladies that took on factory jobs to help to build planes and engines during the war, and uh, many of those planes flew off of the Intrepid. And women actually became test pilots uh, for the first time during World War II as well. Grumman Aircraft out on Long Island had the very first female test pilots, and uh, they flew bombers and fighter planes to get them all ready for battle. Uh, so, you know, while no women directly served on board, they definitely helped out behind the scenes and helped to keep everyone else on board safe, too. Great questions, everyone. All right. So this idea of community, right, was really important for the sailors because, again, imagine you are out at sea for nine months. You are going to be away from your friends and your family, and you're probably going to miss them a lot. You're going to miss a lot of holidays and uh, things that you would normally spend with them as well, birthdays, things like that. Now, within communities, often you can find others who celebrate things like holidays that 
your family might celebrate too. Holidays like, of course, Thanksgiving here in America, or maybe Christmas, or Hanukkah, or Kwanzaa in December. And right now, um, you know, we just had July 4th, for example. So all of these different holidays that many people, and especially in the United States military, they would have celebrated something like that. So they thought it was very important to try to recreate that sense of being at home and to capture that holiday spirit with things like decorations and traditional foods and uh, you know trying to bring to life that joy that we associate with different holidays each year. And while they may not be the families that they were born into at the time, they created all these new bonds and these new families with those that they served on board with on their ships. So for those of you who are tuning in right now, I'd love to hear, first of all, what are some events that you celebrate at home? Maybe, you know, what's your favorite holiday? Uh, maybe you have a big traditional meal that your family eats every year. Or uh, maybe, you know, you celebrate when you hit a milestone, something like a birthday or an anniversary or also an achievement like a graduation or a new job. We certainly just had a lot of graduations just recently, right? So how do you celebrate it? Let us know in the chat what your favorite holidays are or anything like that. And let us know if maybe you also recently celebrated one of those things too, because we'd love to celebrate you on here as well. So let's talk about some of these celebrations on board the Intrepid. One of the first things that often comes to people's minds when they think of celebrations is food. Of course, I know I love a big feast or going out to dinner at a fancy restaurant to celebrate something important to me, right? Who doesn't love food? So year round, something that the Navy has always been known for is really good food. Because if you're going to send thousands of young men out to sea for six to nine months at a time, I mean, what better way than to bribe them with some good food, right? Let's be real. So the food helped to keep their morale up at all times, but especially, of course, during holidays. And Intrepid in particular was known for some really great food. So Intrepid's cooks prepared about seven tons of food every day to feed the hungry crew of over 3,000 men. On board, there are two large kitchens called galleys, fully equipped with the same grills and fryers and ovens that you might find in a large restaurant. And you can imagine, right, what a hot but a fast-paced, exhausting job it would have been to feed all of those ravenous young men on any normal day, let alone during the holidays, too. So typically at mealtimes, crewmen would line up on the chow line, like you can see on the picture on the left here. This is from 1967 on the Intrepid. The sailors took steel trays with them through the serving line. They selected their food. Um, that food was dished out for about 15 hours a day, starting way before breakfast and even going until after dinner. The men then took their food. They returned to the mess or the dining area nearby then to eat. And you can imagine it kind of like uh, a big cafeteria that you might have at school. Uh, the bakers on board, you can see on the right there, also made all the bread and pastries from scratch every day. Uh, in the bake shop, uh, groups of three or four sailors worked for 12-hour shifts. The night shift baked as many as 800 loaves of bread, and the day shift prepared things like desserts, so typically something sweet always with every meal. Um, you'd have about you know 60 smaller cakes and pies and cobblers and cookies for every lunch or dinner, and also, of course, specialties for the holidays. Uh, you also had muffins and cinnamon rolls or other pastries, uh, usually at the chow line for breakfast. But, you know, thinking again about baking all of this food, imagine how hot it would get with all of those ovens going at the same time to make all of those baked goods. <laughs> so chow was a chance, of course, to relax and to take a break from work. And food was especially important for morale around the holidays, right? So the cooks often planned very special meals for things like Thanksgiving and for Christmas. Uh, and this included traditional holiday favorites, things that you're used to eating around that time, many of us, like turkey or ham and many desserts, of course, to help to pass the long hours at sea and to bond the crew into this very tight-knit team. So here in America, right, Thanksgiving Day, a national holiday, uh, and it began as a day of giving thanks for the harvest. So let us know in the chat, do you celebrate Thanksgiving? And what do you normally eat on Thanksgiving? Hmm, what are some things that we normally eat on Thanksgiving? So take a look at this menu here. This is a menu from Thanksgiving that was served on board the Intrepid. They often printed these beautiful commemorative menus at, that the sailors could keep to remember the day as a souvenir. Um, it always had a festive image of the meal that they were being served. This one is from 1945. 
So take a look at this menu here. I'll make it a little bigger so you can read that. Take a look at this menu and let me know, does your family eat any of these same foods for your Thanksgiving meal? So the things that they've got here are roast turkey and gravy, mashed potatoes, mashed sweet potatoes, cream of tomato soup, and oyster dressing. Yeah, a lot of these foods are things that a typical American household might eat on Thanksgiving Day. So for certain celebrations, we often associate specific foods or we celebrate in a particular way as a form of tradition or a custom that's handed down from one generation to another. And turkey on Thanksgiving is certainly one of those here in America, and certainly for those men on board the Intrepid as well, which is, of course, an American aircraft carrier. Now, another thing that people often associate with the holidays are decorations. Oh, and I see in the chat we eat noodles and lava cake for dessert. We do not eat the same food, though. That's so interesting. Noodles and lava cake. That sounds delicious. Oh, I'm going to have to try that soon. So decorations, like I said, when the ship was first built in the 1940s, it was during World War II. It's a very difficult time. So Christmas was very important to many of the sailors. But of course, at the same time, there was a lot of rationing at the time. And that means that, um, that, that products didn't use as much metal or nylon, for instance, because they wanted to save it for use in the military to make things like bullets or um, guns or parachutes or things like that. So people at home uh, and at sea, really, had to get kind of creative with their decorations. And they often would hand make decorations, which I think are actually more fun oftentimes. But they'd hand make these things or even hand make whole trees like this picture you can see on the left. This is made of strips of fabric and wire. So sailors often had to just make do with whatever they could find around the ship or their base to decorate with things. And again, that often led to them getting pretty creative. So you can check out this bulletin board, for example, uh, this pink bulletin board here from the Intrepid in 1967. It says, ho, 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 Merry Christmas to all and a Happy New Year with some decorated paper plates and Christmas cards that were put up in the shape of Santa Claus. Uh, you see a head drawn on top there, though I do think he's wearing a gas mask. <laughs> and on the bottom, there is a lovely spread of nuts and fruits for the crew with some festive decorations. And to me, a tree, if you look closely, that kind of looks like it's made out of coffee filters. I don't know that it is, but it kind of does. So I like to use my imagination and say that it is. Because I would make a tree out of coffee filters. Why not? Now, in addition to the holidays, they also celebrated traditional milestones, too. So for centuries, you know, sailors have engaged in rituals when their ship uh, cr crossed certain markers, such as the equator. And again, these were meant to really bond the sailors and boost their morale. So for instance, on January 22nd, 1944, the first crew to serve the, on the aircraft carrier Intrepid crossed the equator. Now, the crew marked the occasion with this time-honored naval tradition called the Line Crossing Ceremony. Now, to give you a little bit of a backstory here, the open seas have been, of course, the subject of myths and legends since the beginning of seafaring. And early sailors would pray to Neptune, all right, the god of the sea, to ask for protections from things like monsters and storms. So at some point, more than, you know, 400 years ago, right, the line crossing ceremony began for sailors. And it celebrates their transformation from a slimy polywog someone who's never crossed the line of the equator, to a trusty shellback, who's also called a son or daughter of Neptune, who has now become part of a seasoned fraternity of sailors. So it's a way for sailors to be tested for their seaworthiness and really just have a lot of fun with their friends while on board this ship in the middle of nowhere. So here is how this highly theatrical event would work, uh, as illustrated here by a number of pictures from crews throughout history. And yes, this does still happen today. The day before a ship would cross the equator, King Neptune, played by the most veteran sailor, the captain even, would come aboard to proclaim his authority and to pass judgment on all of the slimy polywogs, who he claims have not properly honored him. So he also arrives with his court. Typically, he's got his queen, often played by a sailor in drag. Uh, you've got Davy Jones and the royal baby and all these other dignitaries. And they're all dressed in these very elaborate costumes, uh, oftentimes handmade again. Uh, the polywogs would then entertain him with a talent show. And then the next morning, they would be forced to eat a very unappetizing breakfast. They would perform a variety of embarrassing and messy activities before finally then taking a royal bath 
in a pool of garbage on the deck and then receiving their official certificates. And this certificate would declare them to be officially shellbacks and acknowledge their initiation into the solemn mysteries of the ancient order of the deep. So this certificate was awarded to Louis Gross, who served aboard the Intrepid on its first equator crossing in 1944. Uh, and again, just a very fun, raucous time, lots of memories made, utterly humiliating, I'm sure, for those who had to go through it. But at the same time, it's something that they will then also always look back on and just remember so fondly too. Isn't that always how we remember things more fondly in the past? Now, the equator crossing was not the only one that they celebrated, though. The crew commemorated circumnavigation, so that means all the way around the globe during the Vietnam War with other certificates like the Order of Magellan Certificate. You can see that one on the bottom there. Other certificates uh, initiate sailors into the Order of the Golden Dragon for crossing the international dateline towards Asia. The Royal Order of the Blue Noses uh, commemorates crossing into the Arctic Circle. And the royal domain of the emperor penguin also celebrates crossing the Antarctic Circle. And some other fun ones were uh, if you, for example, were in the goldfish club for pilots, that means that you ditched your plane into the ocean and you had to take a life raft. You also had the caterpillar club for anyone who had to bail out using a parachute. So you might get that reference. The silky material of the parachute is kind of like a silkworm. Makes sense. A member of uh, the commissioning crew of a ship was called a plank owner. And uh, later they actually get an actual plank of the ship when it's decommissioned, which is special. We actually have a few plank owners for the Intrepid too. Uh, and to qualify for the Royal Order of Whale Bangers, you had to have been on board a ship when it mistakenly fired at a whale, thinking that it was a submarine. <laughs> so a lot of fun things to keep them entertained. A lot of these fun little clubs and these fun little certificates that they would come up with as well, because again, they're floating out in the middle of the ocean and had a little bit of free time on their hands. Now, of course, these certificates were not official Navy awards, but they meant a lot to the sailors and the community on board the ship, the community that they built. They made it for really great memories, and it documented many times where a sailor had been and what they had done while they were at sea, too. So it's just a fun thing that they got to do. Uh, so I want to pause here again before we move on and see if we have uh, any other questions in the meantime. Any other questions? Did they have religious services? So they did, absolutely, all year round, uh, actually, but especially, of course, during the holidays to help to keep up people's individual customs and traditions. Uh, the ships recognized the crewmen had you know, a variety of different faiths. So services were held that honored each of these traditions at the time. And crew members would often gather in Intrepid's hangar deck to um, celebrate mass on Christmas Eve. And a number of prayers were printed uh, in the menus. I showed you those menus that they used to give out. A number of prayers were there for a variety of different faiths too. And we also actually have in our archives a Jewish calendar from 1944 that was given out that had Jewish prayers in English and in Hebrew. Um, so, um, you know, a variety of printed materials and then veteran services were available to them uh, nearby some of the posts and bases on land that they would go visit as well. So that is just, you know, a variety of the, the ways that the crew could practice their personal beliefs while they were away from home too. Uh, any other questions? How did they get a Christmas tree on the ship? Right. So that picture that you saw earlier of them decorating um, what looked like a tree, it wasn't actually a pine tree like you might assume uh, you know, a Christmas tree would be, um, but they made one to sort of look like it. Um, during World War II uh, and in Vietnam War, they were often, you know, over in tropical climates. They were in the South Pacific a lot. Uh, and so, um, you know, even though they weren't on land, they wouldn't necessarily well, because they weren't on land, they didn't have access to trees, pine trees specifically. Instead, if they were close to land, they might, you know, have something like a palm tree. Um, but, uh, you know, if they were at sea, they would even kind of make their own makeshift trees out of pipes and hoses. And they'd hang all sorts of stuff off of it, like bullet casings and paint can lids and gas pumps. Uh, there's some really interesting pictures of them <laughs> creating trees like that. Uh, but I know that they used to use things like surgical cotton to make it kind of look like snow. Many of us still use cotton, right? To look like snow around trees at home. Uh, and tinsel actually became very popular during World War II uh, because it was made out of these thin 
silver foil strips. Um, they called it window back then, which is the strangest name, right? But they would drop it from planes to confuse radar signals, these little strips of metal, right? So uh, people would go out into their fields, right? And they would collect all of this silver foil that's falling from the sky. And then they'd use it to decorate, right? Because they didn't have a lot of the, because of all the rationing, they didn't have metal. They couldn't necessarily make uh, you know, ornaments like we have today out of metal or anything like that. So they would use these little strips of foil and decorate. And that tradition has really stuck around. It really does kind of look like icicles hanging from the tree, right? So um, it really does make it look sparkly and magical looking, uh, but they definitely had to get creative. There were no trees at sea, no trees. No, they weren't growing trees or carrying trees with them on the ship. Uh, although I did hear a story once about uh, one time they were in port in San Francisco, the Intrepid was, and they borrowed a tree that they had seen on land nearby. Um, and they actually smuggled it up into the CIC, uh, lights and all, that's the, the command center. Um, and the, they, they later dubbed that Operation Tree. So lots of hijinks, you know, going on all the time with the Intrepid. Probably still today too. Uh, so now there are a ton, of course, moving on here of other celebratory events on board naval ships. And most of them included food, right? We love food, but specifically a cake. So celebrations and their accompanying cakes really brought the entire crew together and boosted morale and helped the crew to take their minds off of some of the more difficult aspects of naval service. Things like uh, boredom and monotony, but then also danger and sadly death. So, uh, for instance, in August of 1944, the Intrepid crew members gathered together to celebrate the first anniversary of the Intrepid's commissioning. So their first birthday party, we can say. This year, of course, had been very difficult for them. The ship had entered the Pacific War, gotten their first battle scars uh, in World War II, and it lost 30 members of its crew uh, to combat, excuse me, to combat or to accidents. So again, they really needed a morale booster at that time. And of course, they made one really, really, really big cake to celebrate uh, at the end of that one really, really big year. So the Intrepid's bakers did not disappoint. As you can see here, they unveiled an elaborate creation for the first anniversary. It is this massive two-tiered sheet cake with a cake aircraft carrier perched on top. The finished weight of this cake, I'm told, was over 728 pounds. It required 90 dozen eggs. And here are the bakers putting some finishing touches on it there. Isn't that just incredible? <laughs> so much. They spent all that time. And as you can imagine, all of those sailors just gobble it right back up again. Now, likewise, uh, in 1968, Intrepid was in the Vietnam War. And the crew took a break to gather on the flight deck in celebration of the Intrepid's 25th commissioning anniversary. So this is a few years later. The ship's bakers designed this elaborate five-layer sheet cake with airplanes on top, and they said it weighed uh, close to 1,400 pounds. This is a full-scale replica, actually, that we have on display uh, at our cakes exhibit right now at the ship. This cake was so big that the sailors had to move it on the bomb lift because it was that heavy. And of course, like I said before, what took a week to make was polished off by hungry sailors in just a matter of hours there. <laughs> but this is a really, really great replica. And a lot of times people walk by here and think it's real. And then they try to stick their finger in it and realize, no, that's not real. <laughs> but it looks real. So props to our exhibits team. They also found a lot of things to celebrate to keep their spirits high, though. Things like a running count of arrested landings. So that's when an airplane's tail hook catches on a steel cable that's across the flight deck to bring it to a stop because, of course, it's an aircraft carrier, so the runway is very, very short. Um, in the photo there, you can see um, the pilots on the right there, pilots in squadron VF-162 celebrating the 51,000th, 51,000th <laughs> arrested landing on board the Intrepid in 1961. Um, and when I say arrested landing, again, that picture that you see on the left, uh, that's a jet plane coming in for a landing and there's that tail hook catching on. Uh, the officers called on the ship's bakers in this particular case, though, to create cakes in celebration of arrested landing milestone. So uh, that's every thousand safe landings. So 51,000 is a pretty big deal for sure. But as you can imagine, baking cakes this big, and you can see all the layers, right, stacked in that photo there on the right. Baking cakes this big, it, and just for so many people, right, it takes a lot of ingredients, as you can imagine. Uh, so the Intrepid left port packed with enough supplies 
uh, to sustain all of the people on board, the 3,000 crew members, for long stretches at sea. And many of the things that they brought with them were canned or dried or frozen so that they could last as long as possible. And it's for that reason, actually, that you'd notice that a lot of recipes include non-perishable items, things like oil as a binding agent instead of eggs, even though many of the, the cakes that I just showed you did have a lot of eggs. Um, but eggs can go bad. So having things that are going to last a little bit longer while at sea and when you know you're not going to be able to get a fresh resupply of food, that is very important. But each Navy recipe, like the one you can see up on screen here, was written to feed 100 people. Now, this is what we're looking at is easy chocolate cake. The cooks would basically scale this recipe. It was a very popular one. It is, it is uh, intended for 100 portions. You can see that on the top there. But the uh, cooks would then scale the recipe to feed the crew of their ship, depending on how big the ship was. So again, the aircraft carrier Intrepid had a crew of a little over 3,000 people, which means that the ship's bakers would then have to multiply this recipe by about 30 to feed the entire crew. So this was a typical cake that they would make to feed them, right? Again, a lot of things that you would need for it. But for holidays, of course, they would make those very special cakes and the ones that we just saw pictures of with all the extra frosting and all the extra, you know, cake aircraft carriers on top and things. So they would use special recipes that called for much, much, much bigger cakes too. Uh, now, I'm actually going to play for you a video that uh, has a, a veteran that kind of is looking back and remembering uh, some of these amazing cakes here. So enjoy, and I will see you on the other side. Well, we're always very proud of special cakes that we made for the special occasions because if they do anything in the Navy is they eat cake. We celebrated Intrepid's 28th birthday. I remember that. We had a big birthday cake. The larger cakes that we made was averaging it for about 2,000, 3,000 people. It takes about roughly a week to make. And pound cake lasts is the best out of all the cakes. Average um, eight pounds per sheet. And each layer, each layer had 20 sheets. We had to put it on a bomb lift, bring the cake from the bakery up to the hangar. I mean, at one point they actually made a model of the Intrepid in, in cake. <laughs> so like I made that carrier cake, it's seven high, and then we start trimming it, then adding to the top and things like that. It's a very big cake. I ate a very big piece. We used to average about uh, 50 to 60 cakes for dinner. There was 12 ovens. We had a, a, an 80 quart mixer. We had a fryer for donuts from the chief. He makes the schedule for what we had to make. We get the menu. We get the ingredients. These days here, now it's in the 60s, they kind of use their hands spreading it out. They never use a knife. It's faster easier. Your hands are in the dough anyway. We made a peanut butter cake, made a white cake, chocolate cake, carrot cake. Everything that we did is for the guys because they're working hard all over the ship. It was a good experience for me. So, you know, be, watching that video and seeing, you know, some of those veterans really remembering that and bring it to life, it's just so special for us because, again, these are people that really served on board the ship and really have these memories. And then for us to be able to uh, show you pictures of that at the same time as well, it really does bring that space to life. So, again, this is something that we have uh, on display right now as an exhibit, um, and I'll mention it a little bit more later. But one other thing that I do want to mention is that, of course, the Intrepid wanted to make the crew feel at home. But sometimes they also had guests on board and really wanted to pull out all the stops for that too. And this has to do with cakes as well. So if you've seen some of our other virtual programs, you might recall that we are a sea, air, and space museum because the Intrepid picked up space capsules back during the space race during the Cold War. Well, the astronauts back then were very much like celebrities that we have today. And each time we picked up astronauts, it was a huge, huge, huge honor to have them on board the ship. 
So these photos are from Gemini 3. Um, that was the mission in 1965 that we picked up. And of course, you know, once you've retrieved an astronaut or two, how do you make them feel special? Bake them a cake, right? <laughs> Obviously. Well, here is Gus Grissom and John Young after having splashed down into the Atlantic Ocean after their successful Gemini 3 mission in 1965. And if you look closely, you might notice what it is that they are cutting the cake with. So a very big cake, everyone, calls for a very large knife. So they are actually cutting their welcome back to Earth cake with sabers, giant military swords that you can see there on the right. So a very, very special cake knife as well as very large cake knife too. Uh, so that's a really, really awesome picture that we have there as well, bringing to life our cakes once more. Now, Navy ships at sea would also host special events like boxing matches and USO shows with concerts and uh, actors and comedians who would come on board to help to raise the spirits of those on uh, on our ship. Uh, if you've ever seen The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, uh, you might have seen, you know, she's doing a stand-up comedy routine at a giant USO show for the Army. So it's kind of similar to that. Everyone used to love to come and to just kind of kick back and forget about whatever they were worrying about and just be entertained for a night or so. Uh, and on the right, actually, you can see a picture of comedian Bob Hope and performer Anne Margaret from a Christmas time USO tour that they did for the armed forces. And they are also standing right there uh, behind what looks like a giant stack of frosting that makes up a tree on another cake. <laughs> so really everyone, if you've learned nothing else, you can leave here today knowing that the sailors liked cake a lot. Uh, and so much so that we actually have an entire exhibit about cakes right now at our museum, if you are in the neighborhood. Uh, as a reminder, our museum is open seven days a week now. Um, and uh, we'd love to have you stop by, check out all the cool things we have on display, including our awesome exhibit, Navy Cakes, which also includes a full-scale replica, as I mentioned, of that 25th anniversary cake that I showed you earlier and swords there are swords <laughs> so definitely come check that out i do love this shot here too though um that really neat kind of bridge thing over the ceiling there is a bunch of uh, sheet pans sheet pans that you'd have for cakes and you can see those giant mixers on display and those huge bags of flour and sugar it's a really awesome exhibit so please do come by uh and check it out so uh, i want to see as we are wrapping up today if we have any other questions uh before we uh finish up for the day any other questions what happened if a pilot missed the cable uh while landing so referring again of course to those arrested landings where the cable stretched across the flight deck uh and they had to snag their tail hook uh, onto that cable in order to stop them. Uh, so again, they would celebrate every successful arrested landing, but what happens if it's not successful, if they don't catch it, right? So that is actually something called a bolter. Uh, your plane is coming in for a landing and you are told actually you are not supposed to slow down for that. They say go full speed. In fact, even go even faster um, because if you do not snag onto that cable, and I think there's actually usually about five of them out there just in case. If you miss one, you keep trying. But if you miss all of those, what you have to do is just just guns blazing, get that speed up and you just keep going. You just shoot right back up again. Don't stop. Just keep going, go up, go around, and come back in and try again. So they specifically, uh, later on in our ship's lifetime, you'll notice that the flight deck is angled. It used to just be one rectangular runway, but they actually angle it slightly for those landings because we had faster planes, those jet planes coming in. Uh, and in the event that they missed all of those cables, if they are going so incredibly fast, they are going to smash into some other planes. So having it offset just like that would allow them to really go up and around again safely. Uh, so that's an important, important thing there. Um, and let's see, why did they have swords on a Navy ship? That's a great question, right? Why do you have swords on a Navy ship? Well, uh, they are not, as you might assume, you know, pirates or swashbucklers. They're not, you know, Johnny Depp, Pirates of the Caribbean. You're not going sword fighting out on the decks, although maybe they did. I don't know. Maybe that was another fun thing that they did. Uh, but obviously they had swords to cut cakes, right? No. <laughs> the military sabers are actually part of their formal uniform. Uh, it's a holdover of the olden days when they actually would need blades on a wooden ship to cut rigging and stuff like that. So pirates, 
actually used to do work with their swords too. They weren't just having sword fights with Peter Pan and stuff. Um, so they would actually, you know, have those to cut um, the, the the ropes and lines and things. Um, but now they're more of a ceremonial symbol of authority for officers. Uh, it really is more of a decoration than anything else. Um, but there are a few really interesting uniform elements in the military like that. For instance, I know in the army, of course, we're the Navy, but I know in the army, um, the helicopter pilots actually have spurs on their boots. And you would think, okay, why do you have spurs? Why do you need spurs to fly a helicopter, right? But it is a holdover from the days when the cavalry would be on horseback. So, of course, we don't really use horses in the military anymore. Instead, we use machinery, things like tanks and helicopters. Uh, but, you know, you would have needed spurs for that a long time ago, too. So, again, it's just kind of more ceremonial and traditional. And I'm sure they don't actually use their swords for anything other than cutting cakes today. So that's why they have them on board, I guess we could say. Um, and Kadesh, I see in the chat, you said, do you have a uh, specific center for baking cakes on board because it's so common? Yeah. So again, those kitchens that I showed you, they had those uh, those big um, ovens. The, those kitchens had massive ovens and that was where they would have to do it. And you can imagine all those layers of cakes, you know, you imagine all those different things that would take a long time, right? So that would be week, you know, in advance that you would be prepping all of that, but they would do that down in the galleys where they would have um, all of their preparations. So great questions, everyone. Um, well, if you happen to think of any other questions, you can always reach out to us uh, through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through our social media, a variety of platforms. We also have a short feedback survey that we will link to in the chat that we would love to get your feedback about this and any of our other programs. So if you have a second, please do fill that out. It'll help us to uh, inform us for future programming. Um, but I want to thank you all so much for watching and sharing your questions and comments with me today. Do be sure to follow or subscribe to this channel uh, and visit our website, of course, for our upcoming programs as well. Our next family program is going to be Thursday at 3 p.m., Jobs on Deck, where you are going to learn a little bit more about what life was like for sailors every day on board the Intrepid and the variety of jobs that they held within our city at sea, not just during celebration times. So once again, that is coming up on Thursday at 3 p.m. All right, my friends. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And hopefully we will see you online for another virtual Intrepid adventure on Thursday or anytime in the future too. All right. See you next time, everyone. Thanks so much.